experts on hate, experts on extremism, civil rights leaders. Whenever journalists mention the Anti-Defamation League, they are always referred to as one or more of the above. The Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith, or ADL for short, has long been thought of as the organization leading the fight to eradicate anti-Semitism and hate. But perception, especially mass media-induced perception, is not always reality. For there is another side to the ADL, a darker, more sinister side. The ADL itself was established in 1913 by a lawyer named Sigmund Livingston, who began with, quote, two desks, $200, and the sponsorship of the Independent Order of B'nai B'rith, close quote, an international Jewish fraternal organization founded in the 19th century. The establishment of the ADL was in response to the hanging of Leo Frank. Between April 26 and 27, 1913, Leo Frank raped and killed a little girl named Mary Fagan. There was a great deal of publicity about the case at the time, and ultimately, Frank was sentenced to death for this heinous crime. However, the Georgia governor, John Slayton, in his last day of office, commuted Frank's death sentence after a great deal of behind-the-scenes dealing. This absolute corruption enraged the locals so much that they took Frank and hung him themselves. The ADL's goal was to provide a counter to any extant anti-Jewish feeling in order to prevent vigilantism of a similar nature in the future, and in its own words become, quote, the nation's foremost champion in the struggle against anti-Semitism, close quote. Since then it has grown into a national nonprofit organization that took in $46 million in revenues in 1998 and employs 200 people into New York headquarters alone. The ADL is commonly known as a civil rights organization, fighting for the well-being of all individuals, Jews and Gentiles alike. The ADL itself states, As the face of America continues to change on the brink of the 21st century, ADL will pursue its ever-challenging quest for equality, freedom, and justice for all people. But as Carl Perlston, a former member of the ADL's executive committee, who served in the upper echelons of the ADL for 25 years, asserts, We were a Jewish organization primarily concerned with issues affecting the Jewish community, and secondarily with equality and fair enforcement of laws for everyone. I recall that many times in days past, we deferred action on an item on the grounds that it was not related to the Jewish community, and was thus beyond our purview. In the 1920s, the ADL took on the anti-Jewish discrimination that was prevailing at the time in the employment and housing sectors from the ADL's website. Colleges and medical schools had quotas limiting the admission of Jews. ADL established facts to influence public opinion against job discrimination and quotas in higher education and sought legal remedies. In the 1950s, the ADL joined the struggle for civil rights and filed an amicus curiae brief in the landmark case of Brown versus Board of Education, which put an end to the odious ruling of separate but equal. These are but two of the actions in the name of civil rights the ADL has taken in its history. But the ADL, fighting the anti-Jewish quota system of the 20s, makes only a token effort, if anything at all, to seek legal remedies to help abolish the anti-white quota system called affirmative action. The ADL's official stance on affirmative action is that the ADL is technically against quotas as quotas, yet supports diversity. The ADL also supports the State of Israel, the apartheid state of Israel. Why does the ADL fight for integration here in the United States, yet wholeheartedly support the apartheid state of Israel, when a true civil rights organization fight against quotas in general and against apartheid policies wherever they may exist? Cunning indeed, ADL, an anti-defamation league that commits defamation. This is from the July 30th, 2002 Jail News Journal. 
Jail is an organization that fights to ensure the accountability of our judges, and one of many organizations that has been tarred by the Anti-Defamation League. The ADL is presented to the American public as experts on extremism as well as hate. Yet after smearing participants of the Homeland Security Expo as extremists, the ADL's director of fact-finding, Mark Piktovich, revealed... I don't know that the ADL has a formal definition for the term extremist. Gun owners, true American patriots, survivalists. All the participants in an event the ADL considers outside of the mainstream are labeled extremist by an organization that doesn't even have, quote, a formal definition, close quote, of this pejorative. Carl Perlston eventually had enough of the hypocrisy and left after 25 years of service. Mr. Perlston recounts how, on one occasion, I once cited the comprehensive study by Yale University Law School's Dr. John Lott on gun laws to the effect that in those states where people could legally carry concealed weapons, crimes against people actually declined, since criminals do not want to take a chance that their victims may be armed. I was met with a sarcastic and dismissive response that only John Lott, Larry Elder, and you believe in that study. When Dennis Prager participated by invitation in a panel discussion on church-state issues, some members actually hissed and booed his remarks in a hostile display of intolerance. A respected board member persistently repeated to all who would hear that Prager was insane. When I expressed my views on some of these matters in various letters and articles in which I was not identified as an ADL board member, I was rebuked in a stern letter from our president advising that I had publicly taken positions contrary to ADL policy, which was not permitted. I had not realized that, as a price of board membership, I had given up my freedom of speech on issues on which the ADL had taken a position. This was much like the old Leninist doctrine of democratic centralism, in which debate is allowed only before a policy is adopted, and no dissent is tolerated thereafter. It seems odd that an organization which boastfully espouses and teaches tolerance and diversity will not tolerate a bit of dissent and diverse viewpoint in its own lay leadership. Carl Perlston witnessed the smears and censorship tactics firsthand. He has also quoted syndicated columnist Mona Sharon, who wrote, The ADL has committed defamation. There is no other conclusion to be reached after reading its new report, The Religious Right, The Assault, Intolerance, and Pluralism in America. It is sad that an organization with a proud history of fairness should have descended to this kind of character assassination and name-calling. Witness the ADL's report, The Religious Right, The Assault on Tolerance and Pluralism in America. The Christian Coalition broke down the, quote, shoddy research, close quote, in their article, How the Anti-Defamation League Systematically Smears Conservative Christians. On June 9, 1994, the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith, an organization created to fight defamation, released a report that alleges with shoddy research and threadbare scholarship that politically active people of faith pose a threat to the survival of American constitutional democracy. The ADL accuses numerous religious conservative organizations and leaders of anti-Semitism and bigotry. In so doing, the ADL itself has committed defamation. The ADL's new definition of intolerance apparently is in disagreement with its liberal politics. The ADL claims its report was the culmination of nine months of research, but it bears none of the signs of a serious research report. It is virtually devoid of specific references to resource materials. The reader is left to simply take it on faith that the ADL's most damning charges are true, which they are not. In fact, much of the ADL's report is simply a retread of materials, some over a decade old, from groups like People for the American Way, Americans United for the Separation of Church and State, the Institute for First Amendment Studies, and other groups that long have had political axes to grind against religious conservatives. Most disturbing, the ADL never contacted the Christian Coalition to get its response to their unfounded charges nor did the ADL try to ascertain the accuracy of many of the quotations used in their report. 
Instead, the report is filled with gross inaccuracies of fact. Quotations are listed without attribution, while others are listed, incredibly, as coming from the Library of People for the American Way. A quotation from Pat Robertson on church-state separation has no source listed at all. Of 28 quotations attributed to Paul Weyrich, founder of the Washington-based Free Congress Foundation, 22 have no source for the quote. One of the most disturbing aspects of the ADL's report is its propensity to lift words out of context so as to distort their original meaning. It does so with reference to the irresponsible charge of anti-Semitism. The ADL has displayed neither tolerance nor respect. Instead, it is engaged in a partisan campaign of innuendo, half-truths, and outright falsehoods. In the 1960s, the ADL published reports and later a book entitled Christian Beliefs and Anti-Semitism, which led to the Vatican Council repudiating important parts of their own Bible. The Vatican Council adopted its statement on the Jews, repudiating Jewish guilt in the death of Jesus and denouncing, quote, hatred, persecutions, displays of anti-Semitism directed against Jews at any time by anyone, close quote. In Matthew 27, 25, it states quite clearly, quote, His blood be on us and on our children, close quote. His refers to Jesus, and us and our children refers to Jews. Thus, the Vatican Council chose the demands of the ADO over its own religion. Some of the victims of ADO smears actually fight back, not just via writing, but in court as well. William and Dorothy Quigley were two victims of an ADL smear campaign, and they decided to fight back. In 1994, the Quigleys began having neighborly disputes with Mitchell and Candace Aronson, a Jewish couple. The Aronsons got the ADL involved, alleging that the Quigleys, quote, were plotting to drive them out of the neighborhood because they were Jewish, close quote. Based on some comments, they illegally recorded the Quigley saying on their cordless phone. The ADL consulted with the district attorney, and advised the Aronsons to continue the illegal recordings for another six weeks. In December of that year, the Aronsons filed charges against the Quigleys, and the ADL immediately began its smear campaign. The case unraveled quickly, and was eventually dropped. The Quigleys then went after the ADL, and won one of the largest defamation awards ever in Colorado, more than $10 million. U.S. District Judge Edward Nineham wrote on March 31st, in a 46-page order and memorandum of decision obtained by the forward, an English version of the Yiddish newspaper from New York. Based on its position in history as a well-respected civil rights institution, it is not unreasonable to infer that public charges of anti-Semitism leveled by the ADL will be taken seriously and assumed by many to be true without question. In that respect, the ADL is in a unique position of being able to cause substantial harm to individuals when it lends its backing to allegations of anti-Semitism. The large damage award will, at a minimum, provide a deterrent effect against the ADL from engaging in future conduct involving the use of intercepted telephone conversations to pursue a civil lawsuit against persons perceived to be anti-Semitic. Adolf Hitler is well known as one of the greatest orators who ever lived. So it was natural that a video collection to be released by Sony entitled The Speeches Collection would feature this man. The ADL protested this move and in a press release stated, In response to a protest by the Anti-Defamation League, a division of Time Warner and Sony has agreed to remove a video on Hitler from a catalog offering a collection of, quote, some of the greatest speeches delivered by world leaders, close quote. The company assured ADL that in the future it would revise its catalog proofing process as well. The League praised such prompt action. Hitler may well be thought of as the most evil being to ever walk the planet. So the actions of the ADL shouldn't really offend very many people. But should a well-liked individual such as Mel Gibson be given the same treatment? Mel Gibson decided, in a tribute to his faith, to make a movie about Jesus' last days originally entitled The Passion. This movie was to be based completely on the Bible, the original Bible that existed until a few decades ago, when it was modified to be more Jewish-friendly, more politically correct. The crucifixion of Jesus was a Jewish affair, according to this politically incorrect Bible. The 
ADL started the anti-Gibson propaganda after a group of Christian and Jewish scholars reviewed the script of the movie and didn't feel it was politically correct enough. Gibson initially decided to stand his ground. Eventually, Gibson caved in under the smears of anti-Semitism and not only stated he would modify the movie to omit Matthew 27-25, for example, but also decided to launch the Jewish Initiative to recruit Jewish and Christian leaders to, quote, discuss the film's effects on Christian-Jewish relations, close quote. However, on January 22, 2004, the Associated Press ran an article that exposed the fact that eight Foxmen and another Jewish leader posed as pastors and, quote, paid their way in, close quote, to a special screening of the movie. They were horrified that Mel Gibson dared to not modify the Bible of his religion to accommodate their demands. The president of the Catholic League, a civil rights organization for Catholics, William A. Donahue, has demanded that Abe Foxman and the ADL publicly apologize for one of the more vicious defamations they've hurled at Christians over this movie. As of the completion of this documentary, the anti-Gibson propaganda was still in full swing. ADL believes that cyberspace is a dangerous place for children in regards to hate. So the ADL created something called the Hate Filter, which not only blocked sites that the Anti-Defamation League found objectionable, but redirected people who went to those sites to a special educational page on ADL's site. Matt Isaacs of San Francisco Weekly. So far, nobody is connecting the dots in a public way. An organization with a history of ruthlessly silencing its critics is trying to dictate the internet content available to the country's young minds. In addition to filtering sites the ADL deems objectionable, they've also been working hand-in-hand -hand with internet service providers to prevent such sites from existing in the first place. The October 21, 1996 ADL press release includes the following statement. We are working with America Online to create an atmosphere of responsibility online, to set standards within the framework of the First Amendment that will give assurances to parents, educators, and communities that there is no tolerance for hate online. These are now part of what are referred to as Agreement to Rules of User Conduct, or Terms of Service. After working with AOL to make sure there was a written policy in place for dealing with that which ADL declares to be offensive, the ADL sent out this press release on April 7, 1997. AOL's Terms of Service state that AOL Incorporated, its affiliates and ICPs have the right to remove content they deem, in their discretion, harmful or offensive. The League calls on AOL to live up to its own commitment. The ADL offers its services as experts on hate, works with ISPs to establish the legal ground needed to limit the amount of hate, then make sure the ISP lives up to its own rules. The ISPs, if they want to avoid bad press, work hard to ensure that the ADL's will be done. In July 1992, Chicago Public Library Research Librarian David Williams presented his well-documented case of anti-Palestinian censorship and all-around genocidal treatment by Israel to the American Library Association. In response to this presentation based on nine years of research the ALA passed two Israel critical resolutions. The ALA took on such an issue because, as then President Marilyn Miller stated, The American Library Association has engaged in issues of human rights and intellectual freedom around the world since its establishment in 1876. Standing up to Israeli censorship and genocidal policies was a logical continuation of this tradition. The ADL and Jewish librarians were quick to react, however, and through their lobbying, threats, and intimidation tactics, eventually managed to have the resolutions pulled. Jeffrey Blankford, in his article entitled, An Act of Censorship, American Library Association Becomes Another Israeli Occupied Territory, wrote, In a statement following the rejection of the resolution, Williams pointed out the implications of the entire issue. Quote, the significance of ALA's breaking with the public taboo on criticizing Israel was taken very seriously by the Anti-Defamation League and other Israel lobby groups whose role is to censor, intimidate, and otherwise stifle public criticism of Israel in the United States. It is precisely because of the importance of U.S. aid that they could not afford to let Israel be criticized in such fashion by a mainstream professional organization." Close quote. 
law professor at the University of Illinois named Francis Boyle felt, quote, the ADL's wrath, close quote, after he and a colleague began giving lectures critical of Israel. ADL members would attend the lectures and shout Boyle down. Boyle stated, I was really surprised. Here I thought the ADL was this great civil rights organization and they're doing these things that are totally antithetical to what academic freedom is supposed to be about. The ADL's mission has allegedly been to combat hate. Making hate a crime, obviously, would go a long way in this battle. And so, through the actions and lobbying efforts of the ADL, a new category of crime called hate crime was born. The Fifth Amendment guarantees protection from double jeopardy, that is, being punished for the same crime more than once. The First Amendment guarantees the right to freedom of speech and thought. Hate crime legislation effectively negates both amendments. As Carl Perlston wrote, This focus on eliminating hate logically led to the creation of hate crimes, in which a two-tier system of criminality was created. One, those who commit crimes of violence for any reason other than hate, and two, those who do injuries solely because they hate the status or class of the victim, race, sex, nationality, religion, disability, occupation, sexual orientation, etc. Criminals of the latter class are punished more severely than those of the former, even though both may commit the same violent crime. The punishment is levied on the thought or feeling or state of mind of the criminal and not the action, in keeping with the emphasis on eliminating and punishing hateful thoughts and feelings. Creating preferred classes of crime victims is not a proper function of the American criminal justice system, nor does it seem desirable to federalize and supplant state criminal law enforcement, which is what results from enacting hate crime legislation at the federal level. The concept of hate crimes inevitably leads to that of hate speech, in which offensive, insensitive, or hurtful speech is legally banned. On January 16, 2004, ADL officials in Florida bragged about the fact that Florida's hate crime laws, quote, were written by the ADL and passed by Florida legislation in 1989. The ADL itself wrote in the introduction to their 1999 hate crimes laws article, ADL has long been in the forefront of national and state efforts to deter and counteract hate-motivated criminal activity. In June 1993, the United States Supreme Court upheld a Wisconsin hate crime statute that was based on model legislation originally drafted by the Anti-Defamation League in 1981. Dalitz, the notorious murderous gangster, actually received an award from the Anti-Defamation League in 1985 due to Dalitz's very generous financial donations to both the ADO and Israel. A quote from the Las Vegas Review Journal article entitled The Double Life of Mo Dalitz by John L. Smith touches on Dalitz's background. Early in his life, Dalitz was a bootlegger and racketeer mentioned in the same breath as Meyer Lansky and Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. In Cleveland, one longtime member of law enforcement would tell the Kefauver Commission, quote, ruthless beatings, unsolved murders, and shakedowns, threats, and bribery came to this community as a result of gangsters' rise to power, close quote. Dalitz was considered part of that rise. Indeed, Mo Dalitz was killed just four years after receiving the award in a gang shootout that left seven others dead. Meyer Lansky's granddaughter, Mira Lansky Boland, was described in the Village Voice article by Robert Friedman of May 11, 1993 as the ADL's top fact finder in Washington. Jonathan Pollock, while working at the Navy's Anti-Terrorist Alert Center, stole thousands of pages of classified documents for Israel, which, according to federal prosecutors, quote, could fill a room the size of a large closet, 10 feet by 6 feet by 6 feet, close quote. The Navy's Anti-Terrorist Alert Center was where some of the most closely guarded U.S. secrets could be accessed. Pollard was sentenced to life in prison as a result of this massive espionage. Robert Friedman wrote in the Village Voice, Pollard's handler was Avi Sella, an Israeli Air Force colonel whose wife worked for the New York ADL as a lawyer. Pollard later wrote to friends that a prominent ADL leader was deeply involved in the Israeli spy operation. 
The ADL was not disbanded or otherwise punished for their role in this spy case. In the waning days of the Clinton era, many questionable pardons were granted to infamous criminals. Probably the most noteworthy example of this was the pardon of Mark Rich, quote, a defiant fugitive accused of the biggest tax ripoff in U.S. history, close quote. Clinton made a lot of enemies during his presidency, especially amongst Republicans. So naturally, Republicans led the charge into investigating Pardon Gate. Abe Foxman, director of the ADL, was, quote, mentioned in internal memos of the Free Mark Rich team as a man who could be helpful, close quote. The ADL stated it wanted to help Mark Rich because of, quote, humanitarian reasons, close quote. In reality, the ADL helped Rich for two main reasons. First, he was an ardent supporter of Israel. And second, Rich donated a quarter of a million dollars to the ADL in the years leading up to Pardon Gate. In fact, Abe Foxman, according to Brian Blumquist of the New York Post, quote, admitted he sought a presidential pardon for Mark Rich a month after his group accepted a $100,000 donation from the billionaire financier. Verena Dominic of the Chicago Tribune wrote, in January 2000, Zevi Rafiak, an Israeli businessman and friend of Foxman, called to say Rich Foundation head and former Mossad agent Abner Azoulay wanted to meet the ADL director. That was followed by a note from the foundation pledging $100,000 to the ADL, Foxman said. In February 2000, over dinner in Paris, Foxman suggested to Azoulay that Rich seek a pardon. Carl Perlston wrote quite plainly that he did not help himself, quote, by dwelling on our national director's central role on behalf of the ADL and devising and wangling a pardon for criminal fugitive tax evader, Mark Rich, close quote. The ADL's connection with spy extraordinaire Jonathan Pollard, as written by Robert Friedman, deserves to be mentioned again. In 1987, the ADL came under FBI scrutiny in the wake of the Pollard spy scandal. While assigned to the Navy's Anti-Terrorist Alert Center, where he had access to the most closely guarded U.S. secrets, Jonathan Pollard stole thousands of pages of classified documents for Israel, which, according to federal prosecutors, could fill a room the size of a large closet 10 feet by 6 feet by 6 feet. Pollard's handler was Avi Sela, an Israeli Air Force colonel whose wife worked for the new ADL as a lawyer. Pollard later wrote to friends that a prominent ADL leader was deeply involved in the Israeli spy operation. Pete McCloskey, a former Republican congressman, said, The number one goal of the ADL is the protection of Israel. Any group whose sole purpose is to protect a foreign nation should not have anything to say about what's said or written here in America. ADL members would attend the Israel critical lectures of Francis Boyle and shout Boyle down. Well said of the ADL. The ADL was far worse on Jews who criticized Israel than they were on Arabs. They treated them like traitors. The ADL has turned itself into a dirty tricks organization for Israel. Just as the NKVD persecuted Russians and Ukrainians, just as the Joint Terrorism Task Force persecutes Americans, and just as the Gestapo persecuted Germans, the ADL persecutes enemies, Jews and Gentiles alike, of its state the state of Israel. Tom Girard, San Francisco police officer who provided the ADL fact finder Roy Bullock with SFPD records, was sent to Israel on an all expenses paid trip by the ADL. Richard Hershot, the former director of the ADL's San Francisco office, gave testimony stating that, quote, up to half of the ADL's activities in the seven years between 1986 and 1993 had been centered on discrediting political views that disagreed with the organization's support of Israel. Close quote. Carl Perlston states quite plainly, The ADL has always been a firm and loyal supporter of Israel. Lenny Brenner met a man named Erwin Swall and later discovered, after a night of drinking, that Mr. Swall was the ADL's top fact finder at the time. Mr. Brenner was told that the group he supported, the leftist National Association for Irish Justice, had enemies of Israel within it. In other words, the National Association for Irish Justice was being spied on by the ADL for Israel. In its October 4th, 1999 press release, the ADL, quote, expressed concern, close quote, about Austria's Patriotic Freedom Party, a party the ADL smears as, quote, right-wing, xenophobic, anti-Europe, close quote. The 
Freedom Party wants, among other things, some immigration control and the right of the Austrian people to decide what's best for them. Contrast this with ADL's non-stance on the National Union, an Israeli political party that advocates and is working for the transfer of Palestinians from Israel. ADL has yet to issue a press release denouncing the extreme right-wing xenophobic anti-Gentile National Union. In fact, one need go no further than the ADL's own website for abundant proof of their unabashed support of Israel. The ADL gives advice on how to lobby our politicians for Israel. They even refer to Israel as the Jewish state, the very same Israel that has stockpiled in illegal cash of weapons of mass destruction, that has been carrying on a policy of ethnic cleansing against Palestinians, that attacked the USS Liberty in 1967, killing more than 30 American sailors that has been the world's leader in the white sex slave trade as written about in the Jerusalem Post magazine of June 16, 2000, and so much more. The ADL officially started its fact-finding in the 1930s from the ADL's website. During this decade, ADL began its major fact-finding operation and began accumulating its famous storehouse of accurate detailed, unassailable information on extremist individuals and organizations, ADL expanded its staff and began to monitor and investigate the rapidly multiplying fascist groups in the U.S. The fact-finding wasn't just limited to accumulating information. In at least one case, the fact-finding may very well have led to murder. The chairman of the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee, Alex Oda, was killed by a booby trap bomb when he opened the door of his office in Santa Ana, California on October 11, 1985. ADL fact finder Roy Bullock had infiltrated the AADC and had stolen the key to the same office. The three Jewish suspects fled to Israel before the FBI could apprehend them. And even though Bullock had the stolen key of the AADC office in his possession at the time of the bombing, neither he nor any of his employers in the ADL were ever charged in connection with Oda's murder. In 1993, the magnitude of the ADL's spy operation and really, spy operation is the only way to describe the ADL's activities, became known after police in Los Angeles and San Francisco raided local ADL offices and discovered that the ADL was, quote, keeping files on more than 950 political groups, newspapers, and labor unions, and as many as 12,000 people, close quote. Many of the victims were people who, quote, simply opposed the policies of Israel, close quote. The California spy scandal was focused on two individuals, the aforementioned Roy Bullock, a man who, quote, was an undercover spy who picked through garbage and amassed secret files for the Anti-Defamation League for nearly 40 years, close quote, and Tom Girard, quote, a former CIA agent and San Francisco police officer accused of providing confidential material from police files to the Anti-Defamation League, close quote. Tom Girard, the ADL's contact in the SFPD, after fleeing to the Philippines, left behind a briefcase that contained, among other items, Extensive information on death squads, a black hood, apparently for use in interrogations, and photos of blindfolded and chained men. Investigators suspect that Jared and other police sources gave the ADL confidential driver's licenses or vehicle registration information on a vast number of people. Despite each case of obtaining such information from police being a felony, and added up, thousands of felonies were thus committed. One veteran police officer astutely predicted, Mark my words, this is going to be obfuscated, obliterated, and desecrated. It's going to be a classic study in how things get covered up. You don't do Jewish people in San Francisco. It's not PC, especially when you have two U.S. senators who are Jewish, and the city's chief of protocol is Dick Goldman, a prominent fundraiser in the Jewish community. And this police officer was right, Matt Isaacs. Although thousands of non-public documents were found in the possession of both Bullock and the ADL, the city offered a settlement agreement to the organization in November of 1993. As a result of the deal, the ADL paid a $75,000 civil fine, most of which went to charitable causes along the lines of the ADL's own interests, such as a hate crimes reward fund, while denying all allegations of wrongdoing. Indeed. Despite the potential public relations disaster that could have ruined the ADL after this massive spy ring was uncovered, the ADL has continued its questionable methods and has used the information it has gathered via these questionable methods to forge partnerships with law enforcement. In 
addition to bribing law enforcement officers to give them confidential files as part of their spy operations, the ADL has also been working overtly with law enforcement, getting paid large amounts of money to train police officers and government officials. The ADL has set up what it calls a Law Enforcement Agency Resource Network. As part of this network, the ADL, quote, offers to provide training to police personnel on how to recognize and deal with hate criminals and speech criminals, close quote. In 2002, then-police chief Bernard Parks signed a formal agreement with the Anti-Defamation League in order to allow the Los Angeles Police Department and the ADL to share information in the effort to protect citizens from ADL-declared haters and extremists. The then-Los Angeles Regional Director of the ADL in response to the agreement. We are committed to providing law enforcement agencies with the resources and tools to augment their ongoing efforts. We have extensive resources available to law enforcement, including current and archival information, analysis, and programs. What isn't mentioned is that much of the archival information was obtained illegally. Considering that Los Angeles was one of the cities prominently involved in the ADL spy operation less than a decade earlier, it is quite shocking that the LAPD would enter into such an agreement. But Bernard Parks hasn't been the only high-ranking law enforcement official to ally himself with the Anti-Defamation League. Elmer H. Tippett Jr., Vice President for Public Safety at the Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority was... Pleasantly surprised to learn of the vast capabilities and the assistance your organization is capable of rendering to law enforcement. L.A. County Undersheriff William T. Stonick. I laud the efforts of the Anti-Defamation League for their foresight and commitment to partnership with law enforcement to ensure that our communities are free of the scourges of bigotry and hate. Through our partnership, we will be able to provide line-level law enforcement with links to community-based organizations, enhanced education and information sharing that will bring greater efficiencies to our fight against bigotry and hate. The Sheriff's Department stands with our partners in law enforcement and the Anti-Defamation League to lead the fight against racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, and bigotry in all its forms. Bill Bratton, former New York City Police Commissioner. ADL's new law enforcement initiative with its new webpage and training curricula will prove to be a significant addition to law enforcement efforts nationwide to deal more effectively with extremists, hate groups, and biased crimes. I applaud their efforts. Chief Donald Martin, President, Bergen County Police Chiefs Association and Chief Edgewater, New Jersey Police Department. Freedom from fear and hate is guaranteed under the U.S. Constitution. Every law enforcement official guarantees he will do his best to protect and defend those freedoms. In the conquest of fear and hate, too often the tools upon which law enforcement relies on fall short. This is why I'm sincerely thankful to ADL for providing these essential tools to get rid of the fear and hate. CIA Deputy Director for Intelligence, Johnny McLaughlin. For nine decades, the ADL has fought hatred and intolerance and prejudice and discrimination here in America and abroad. Director of the FBI, Robert Mueller, in May 2002. We in the FBI tremendously value your perspectives and your partnership. Your insights and research into extremism are particularly helpful to us, shedding light on the changing nature of the terrorist threats facing America. Your support of hate crime and terrorist investigations, which are now front and center in the work of the FBI, is essential to us and the training and education you provide for the FBI and for law enforcement have never been more relevant. That includes a conference on extremist and terrorist threats that you were sponsoring later this month at the FBI Academy. So thank you for all these efforts. And again, I look forward to working with you to strengthen our partnership. The Law Enforcement Agency Resource Network also includes training on how law enforcement can better protect American citizens from extremists and haters. On Tuesday, April 16, 2002, the ADL hosted a meeting of the Committee on Terrorism of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. This committee, chaired by a senior FBI official from Washington, heard presentations from ADL experts on Islamic fundamentalism and domestic terrorism and saw a demonstration of ADL's LEARN website, a new CD-ROM guide to extremism in America. In October 2002, the ADL sent out a press release in which they declared, 
By the end of 2002, more than 1,000 Colorado police officers will have completed the Anti-Defamation League's anti-bias training. On March 25, 2003, the ADL with the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the United States Attorney's Office held a conference entitled Domestic Terrorism from Detection to Response. Joanna Libros, ADL Director of Investigative Research, Southern Region, and Coordinator of the conference. This conference was used as a resource, not only for law enforcement officials to update their methods, but to build relationships with officers from around the Southeast. On May 8, 2003, Robert A. Martin, the Anti-Defamation League's Director of Security, addressed the International Association of Chiefs of Police Committee on Terrorism at the organization's mid-year meeting in Dallas, Texas. The meeting was also attended by representatives of the Dallas Police Department and the Dallas FBI. Mr. Martin gave an overview of ADL and its expertise in domestic terrorism and hate crimes. In July 2003, the ADL gave hate crime training to officers in Gloucester, Massachusetts. According to the ADL, the training is a follow-up to a more limited ADL hate crimes training in which the department had participated along with 200 other police departments throughout Massachusetts in 2000. This instruction is the latest in a current series of law enforcement training sessions in ADL's New England region. In June, ADL provided similar training to chiefs and senior detectives in 15 Massachusetts communities. On January 14, 2004, Vermont's local paper, the Rutland Herald, published an article exposing the fact that the ADL sent 16 high-level law enforcement personnel to Israel for training so that our law enforcement officers could, quote, learn from the Israelis, close quote. 